So whether you're new to technology, whether you're new to the cybersecurity space, or whether you've been maybe playing around with different sorts of tech and you wanna maybe move or learn more about cybersecurity specifically, here are five things that I recommend that are good, I guess, starting projects that you can try out yourself to become great at cybersecurity. And these are almost like good elementary starting areas. Later on, you build on these. Later on, you go and get more certifications to become a cybersecurity expert. And then hopefully one day you can go and land a great job in cybersecurity earning the big bucks. So I've worked with lots of cyber experts throughout the years. And these are some of the projects that I gave them to do. And I think it helps them pretty good. And hopefully these help you as well. Hey, as always, I love tech and this is a YouTube channel all about technology. And I would love it if you did a subscription button press, click on the button, click on the bell so that you don't miss out on anything. You know that managing workloads, workflows for IT teams in companies is really, really challenging. And there are so many solutions out there. Where do I start? Understanding tickets that are coming in, making sure that you're triaging them accordingly and assigning them to the right people. You can now use a new AI agent builder built right in to make that whole process so much easier, automating a lot of your tasks. So the IT teams can shift from all of this firefighting mode to high impact work. Something that I love, for example, is using Active Directory and having it integrated into sys So I can you know, onboard a new staff member and I can now add a new entry into Active Directory and do all of the configurations directly from the sys platform. No need to log in to Microsoft 365 or log into AD and doing it manually. It cuts out all of these manual tasks and it is brilliant. So there's now no more need for manual ticket by ticket resolution the AI agent can now take care of a lot of that heavy lifting. So SIS8 really, really does take out the complexity of managing a proper IT service desk. Go and check it out down below. I've got a link to it. Pick it up right now, SIS8. We're gonna go down from number five down to number one. First things first, I always recommend getting started by having yourself a lab, a ethical hacking lab. So what do I mean by ethical hacking? Well, hacking, is bad. Hackers are known as the people with the dark, you know, hoods, hoods, the things covering their faces in front of a computer looking really, really malicious. And that is not good. And, and look, a lot of these people have learned how to do hacking techniques that are unethical. So they're not for good purposes. Some of them may say that they're for good purposes, but really a bit of a gray area. It's a really gray area. And if you ever talk or, or get into the world of uh, people who are big into cybersecurity, there's a really fine line around good hacking and bad hacking. And you know you can talk about that topic for hours, but when we are talking about ethical hacking, we're talking about the good people. We're talking about the people who know how to do the hacking. They know all the tips, they know all the tricks, they know all the techniques that are used by hackers, yet they're doing it for good purposes, for the purposes of maybe letting a business know that they have been impacted or maybe to go and protect your own network. A whole bunch of the techs that I work with have done a really good job at securing the network, but sometimes I need that external person to come in and perform some ethical hacking against my network to actually go and penetrate, try to do some penetration testing against my network to see whether they can get in. And then if there are any vulnerabilities, any things that are open, I can go and fix them, they're pretty good. So for you, what I recommend is to actually set up yourself your own lab environment to go and test some of this stuff yourself. So what you can do is you can go to the interwebs and you can download things such as VirtualBox, you can get VMware Workstation, you can get Proxmox, any of these virtualization platforms, essentially software that you can install onto your computer and then create a number pool of virtual machines or servers running on computers. And something that I like to do is then go and install relevant operating systems. If you've heard of Linux, Linux of course is that awesome open source distro where you can just do a really heap of cool stuff. And one of the flavors of Linux is called Kali Linux. And it's almost like being built and designed for the hacking and ethical hackers and penetration testers and security experts. For those who wanna know more about security, Kali Linux is the bomb. Now, once you have Kali Linux installed, because it's Linux, you've got the GUI, you've got the graphical user interface, all of the icons, all of that, but you've also got a backend command line, which is uh, really important. If you wanna learn a lot more about this space, uh, learn Linux commands, stuff that you can run behind the scenes, like almost like a DOS, black DOS window, but specialized for Linux, and you can do a whole bunch of more stuff. But Kali Linux out of the box, 
comes installed with a whole bunch of tools that you can use to learn how to hack. Now, I'm not gonna delve through every single one because there's so many out there, but you've got a tool, for example, called Nmap, where you can get a nice little map, a little scan of a network. You run this when you're on a network and you can see what's going on. You can do the Metasploit framework, you can do a SQL vulnerability scanner as well, some tools that you can see whether a database has any holes in it. You can use an air crack tool that essentially can see vulnerabilities and exploits available on a Wi-Fi network. John the Ripper for password cracking, and there's a whole bunch more. The next one is to learn about firewalls. Now firewalls, of course, are used in every single home and probably every single business. So when you're at home, you've probably got a router for your main internet. Every business has their internet connections coming in and most businesses would have some sort of a firewall, essentially some sort of tool that can monitor the traffic coming in and out of a network, ports coming in and out, IP addresses coming in and out, and you can control those IPs, you can control those ports and only allow the traffic that you need in and out of a network. So there are two main types of firewalls. You've got hardware-based and software-based firewalls. The hardware-based firewalls are the ones that you go down to your shop and you buy one. You've got Cisco firewalls, you've got FortiGate firewalls, you've got Juniper firewalls, you've got Palo Alto, all these massive brands of hardware-based firewalls. And then you've also got software-based firewalls. And software-based firewalls are ones that you can run potentially on servers. One that you need to learn about and one that I recommend as part of your learning is using PFSense, a great tool that lets you install essentially firewall-based server software on a computer and then convert that computer into a firewall. So go and download PFSense for free, install it within your virtual lab, right, as its own VM, and then go and play around with firewalls. Learn about what traffic you can make come in, what traffic you can allow out, whitelisting, blacklisting, and everything in between. Within your virtual lab, go and play around with what's called IDS, Intrusion Detection Systems, or IPSs, Intrusion Prevention Systems, essentially tools that can monitor odd, weird behavior on networks. It's gonna be essential, especially if you're working in a business that has lots of traffic, lots of data, lots of servers, lots of solutions inside, outside your network, learning about how your network traffic flows and what is allowed in, what is allowed out, what is allowed to traverse throughout your network is pretty important. You can use these tools to detect any brute force attacks potentially on websites. You've got packets that flow through networks, traffic that flows from point A to point B, and you can put systems in place that can interpret that behavior, interpret the, the packets that are flowing through and go, huh, does this look fishy or not? So it's actually sniffing them and making sure that they pass the sniff test. A couple of tools that you can try, one would be Zeek, Snort as well, and then there's a whole bunch more. Now before we do jump onto the number one thing, which I think is awesome, is uh, try simulate attacks on yourself. So if you've got the ability to have your lab set up, or maybe in a workplace, you've got your own little sandbox UAT testing environment that you can play around with, simulate a DDoS attack, simulate a phishing attack against you, simulate a virus, malware that has been installed and is spreading throughout your network. As part of a job of a cybersecurity engineer, you are gonna face this from time to time. And one thing that you can do, and you can do very, very well, is be prepared because you've experienced this potentially in a lab environment. See if you have the ability to do some of this penetration testing yourself. Find a website, a partner with a website that you may be able to say to them, hey, I wanna go and test my skills using something like Kali Linux and all the tools that are built in. Can I hack into your website? Can I see what I can find on the website? If you've got a network, a full LAN, sandbox environment set up, see what you can get in. See if you can elevate your own privileges. Let's say if you're on a domain, you're a standard domain user, you need to elevate yourself to become this domain admin, global admin, so you've got full admin rights. Can you elevate your own privileges? So it's sometimes good if you're working in a company, if you have the ability in a home lab and you have a proper setup, try to hack yourself. It's pretty good. The number one thing that I recommend, and it's just really, really cool to, to learn how to do, and almost I would say every single company should have one of these set up in some form or fashion, is to create what's called a honey pot. Honey pot. If you see a pot of honey, it looks pretty nice. It looks pretty attractive. It looks pretty delicious. You may wanna go 
and explore and have a look. But you know what? It's a decoy. It's not actually real. What a honeypot does is it gives you the ability to mimic a real system, to mimic a real device on a network. So you've got a core switch, well, you can create a honeypot that looks like a core switch. If you've got a web server, your real life web server, you can have another web server, essentially it's a honeypot that is on your network. And the whole intention of this is you wanna make sure that your real life network systems, your real life servers, etc., don't get touched. You want them to be secure, you want them to be safe. So you can create decoys across your network, honeypots across your network, so that if there is some odd behavior, if there's somebody trying to get into a network, they go, oh, this looks like a real thing. I'm gonna go and attack it. And you know what happens when they attack the honeypot? You get alerted that something fishy is going on in your network, that somebody has triggered your honeypot. So then you have some signs, there's something strange going on in my network, or you could be under attack. So by having a honeypot, you can be prepared and prevent things from going further because they've just trapped it. So it's like a mouse trap. They just, ah, they, they, they've been caught. They don't know it because to them, it looks like a real device on the network. So there's a whole bunch of honeypot systems and servers that you can use to set up, but they're great. And I think they're really, really effective. So if you're not using them, use them. If you want to learn about them, go and install one in your own lab. If they get triggered, if they get tripped, boy, that's a good feeling. You can be like, hey, a honeypot, a fake little thing, just identified some strange behavior. And then you could potentially save the business millions of dollars because the real systems are safe because you caught it in the honeypot. But look, this is the, the start of your journey. From here, go and learn more. Like, comment, subscribe, do the whole thing. We'll see you on the next video.